Hello, my name is Christy Knickerbocker. I'm a speech language pathologist and I own and run a private practice specialty voice clinic in Fort Worth, Texas in the United States of America. And I've been invited to speak to you all very briefly about um, the fact that I am a speech language pathologist but that I have a singing voice specialty because of my training and experience and how I feel it's important for anybody who is going to be singing at an athletic level um, or has vocal problems or a history of voice issues, um, it's important for them to be trained um, and or see a speech pathologist for, uh, for education about the vocal mechanism. So thank you very much for having me. So what I want to start with today is just briefly about what the certification is for speech pathology um, and then the training that I felt allowed for me to be able to see the singing voice uh, as a specialty. For speech pathology in America, you're needing to acquire an undergraduate degree in communication sciences and disorders. This is a four-year degree, and I was able to obtain this at Texas Christian University. I had initially started that degree as vocal performance. It was going to be a music major because I had had uh, a scholarship for vocal performance and been accepted to the school under those terms. Unfortunately for me, my senior year of high school, right before I began my collegiate studies, I developed a cyst, a unilateral one, on my left vocal fold. This required me to have surgery and voice rehabilitation with a speech language pathologist who had a special training uh, in treating injured singers. I then went on to rehabilitate with my voice teacher in college and uh, I was basically singing the equivalent of nursery rhymes for my final juries, which are the singing finals for different semesters of uh, um, Masters of Music. And uh, my voice teacher came to me and said, this is probably not where you're going to end up with your career, so you likely need to begin thinking and mulling over uh, something else besides vocal performance, which was devastating to me at the time. However, I looked through my brain and thought I really enjoyed what my speech language pathologist had done for me. And I remembered my worry when I was initially diagnosed before anything happened. I was afraid that the speech therapist, right, wouldn't know anything about singing. I was freaking out at that time. And so I knew in that moment, when she had said that to me, that I needed to be the person that people who sing went to see without worry. That they could know that although it's speech therapy or considered speech pathology, that it actually is all about vocal coordination and that they would be in the very best hands when seeing me as a treatment provider. So. I had grown up doing voice lessons, taking piano lessons, taking guitar lessons, so I was already very musically inclined before beginning college. Uh, I had performed in recitals, uh, done private uh, performances, musical theater, I had done starring roles in multiple productions. Um, and then I switched to communication sciences and disorders while I continued to minor in music for my undergraduate studies. I then went on to specialize in voice and chose a graduate school that I knew was going to have a mentor in the area of voice rehabilitation. And I went to school for two more years, so six years total, uh, to obtain my Master's of Science uh, in Speech Language Pathology. After you get that, in America you have to obtain a Certificate of Clinical Competency, so ASHA, our governing board, has to decide that uh, you have completed all of your necessary educational requirements, um, and then you have to get a license to practice in the state in which you reside or the state that you choose to provide therapy in if you're doing telepractice. 
There's no special certification at this point that you have to obtain to treat injured singers. In our scope of practice, it is our, um, is our ethical obligation to feel confident and competent in being able to treat people with certain disorders. So I definitely feel confident based on my training and performance experience to be able to know exactly what the singer is going through to be able to give them the best treatment. The trainings on top of my degree that I obtained either during graduate school on my own or after included uh, Lisak Madsen's resonant voice therapy, uh, the Casper Stone confidential flow therapy that ties into that, stretch and flow. Um, I, have, I always attend conferences during the year when I can that are specific to voice disorders. Um, I also speak at conferences so it helps me pull from the research and stay really current on specific things that I need to know to treat my patients. Um, I'm certified in Lee Silverman voice treatment. I'm certified for swallowing therapy as well um, with both Vital Stem and the AMP Care ESP protocol. Uh, and then I often attend, when I can, um, continuing education opportunities like uh, master classes at local universities where someone's coming in and, and conducting a master class, um, online master classes. Um, I'm a member of the National Association of Teachers of Singing, or NATS. I'm also a member of PAVA, the Pan American Vocology Association. And I know that if you're familiar with the word vocology, um, Vocology is trying to incorporate not only speech pathologists, but other working professionals um, such as choir teachers, vocal pedagogy teachers, um, performers, uh, laryngologists all over the world so that we have a common nomenclature, so that we're calling things the same across all countries in the world, um, bringing us together to help bridge the gap between science and art. So in my clinic, I regularly provide voice therapy for just everyday voice users. So this can be anybody from post-surgery um, where they've had intubation trauma and they have lesions or paralysis of their vocal cord. Um, they may have had spinal surgery or thyroid surgery where there was an anterior incision and they have weakness or paralysis of the vocal cord as well. I see people who have neurogenic um, voice disorders, people who have lesions from phonotrauma, like vocal nodules, like polyps, like cysts, um, people who have muscle tension dysphonia. Maybe that's secondary to vocal cord bowing. Um, a lot of times with my older singers who may sing not necessarily for money, um, but they for quality of life. They sing in church. They sing for their family. Um, they sing for praying, um, for their religious affiliation. Um, whatever they're doing, they're experiencing the aging of, of the vocal cords, the, the presbylaryngeous, and then the muscle tension that, that can accompany that. And without realizing um, what they're actually experiencing, they get very frustrated and feel like they have no voice at all and that they have no choice but to just live with it. So that's where I'm an advocate for those patients. On the other end of that too, I also see gender spectrum patients. So people who are born and assigned a specific gender at birth based on their anatomy, but perhaps they identify with another gender. Most of the time it's male to female, um, and I'm teaching all of the components of being perceptually masculine versus perceptually feminine for a person so that they can understand that, be able to manipulate the different parts of the vocal system, and be able to have a voice that really represents who they are on the inside. Fast forward to professional voice users that I see. So this can be anybody from a preacher to a teacher, phone call operator, judges, lawyers, um, and these are your actors your, or your voiceover actors, um, singers of any caliber. Um, I see a lot of church singers who maybe do that for a living. They preach and they sing. Um, opera singers are uh, people who are students and they have classical training. Uh, also contemporary commercial musicians. And what may surprise you um, is that I find my contemporary commercial musicians who have vocal issues have never had a voice lesson. And that's insane to me because in America, I don't know how it is in other places in the world, but 
If you're getting a college career in vocal performance, the only option is to train as a classical singer. So with opera training, where you're, where you're training yourself to sing in the opera setting. Um, but there's really not a track that's very popular for contemporary commercial musicianship. Um, and these singers who have talent, they're grabbed by an agency or a label or a manager, and then they're shoved into this lifestyle where they're having to have all of these different uh, stressors on them. They sing well with low vocal demand, but when they're thrust into a situation where they have really high vocal demand, they may develop a voice disorder. And that's when I end up seeing them. So I think an important thing to remember when you're a speech pathologist seeing a professional singer is that you may not know what type of singing background that person has at all. So I never approach someone who's come to me as a singer thinking that they've ever had a voice lesson, but I don't presume that they haven't. So I'm always uh, encouraging an open line of communication there. One, so I'm not offending anyone, and also so I don't come across like, I think I know everything, because I do not. Um, what you want to remember, uh, key specific points when you're seeing singers, is that you need to focus for indirect and direct voice therapy. Indirect is going to include for your singers vocal hygiene, including hydration. So that can be systemic where they're drinking enough water that's hydrating and they're avoiding things like uh, that are dehydrating. So they're avoiding um, alcohol, especially liquor. They're avoiding cigarettes um, or marijuana or anything else that they might smoke like vapor e-cigarettes. I don't know how popular those are um, in other places in the world, but they're pretty popular here in America. Um, also, Paying attention to medications. So in America, we have to have an otolaryngology examination before beginning voice rehabilitation as speech language pathologists. So a lot of times that doctor is going to examine the patient and then address allergies with medications and or reflux with medications. Um, that will help me treat and prevent phonotrauma where the patient is throat clearing or coughing or yelling, um, talking loudly over ambient noise. Um, I'm also asking a very detailed case history with these singing patients, a little more detailed specifically about um, the places where they're needing to use their voice. So I wanna know their performance settings. Is it always in one place where they can have their mic, their monitors, everything set up the way they like it? Or are they traveling where they really have to accommodate and make sure they're their own best advocate for being able to hear themselves when they're on stage and the type of equipment that they may have available to them? Um, it's also that I want to educate and modify the environment um, where voice is used with really healthy behaviors. Um, we're wanting to avoid misuse, avoid yelling, make sure we're educating them on what kind of rest is important and what kind of things you want to do for a vocal warm up and for a vocal cool down. As well as direct voice therapy. This is going to include behavioral modification in the way of actual coordination of the sound production. So you want to achieve at discharge a good and efficient distribution of respiratory support, phonatory uh, movement, so the ability for the vocal folds to vibrate symmetrically, as well as resonance, and the utilization of the vocal cavity in a way that one of these subsystems is not working harder than the other two.